Testing, testing. Can you hear? Can people hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, uh, bienvenue. Bon, mais je vais parler maintenant en anglais, même si on est à Paris. <laughs> bon, uh, welcome everybody uh, and welcome to Paris. This is the uh, session for the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, and we're here to create a new agenda, an exciting agenda and a timely agenda, which is why we have many speakers who will speak briefly uh, so that we can create a 360 degree agenda that actually integrates understandings of sustainable futures, the internet, human rights, and all that we mean by the environment, our built environment and our natural environment. Because at every point in the timeline of computers, of internet networks, electricity is consumed, precious minerals are mined from the depths of the earth, plastics are engaged, silicon is needed, Networks create energy, they emit heat, they need cooling. And the more we use the cloud, the more we need data centers, and the bigger those data centers are becoming, the more electricity they need, the more heat they produce, and on it goes. So we have here an extraordinary range of speakers and agendas. And we also want to consider not just the natural environment, but also the future of our cities as they become increasingly networked and increasingly dependent on computing and internet-based networks. So again, electricity is needed, heat is emitted, and at all times we need to consider what about the citizens of our countries and the residents of our cities, the poorest of the poor who are in um, need of food and shelter, the richest of the rich. All the promises of broadband and all those things, these imply an environment. They imply the natural environment and the built environment, which is why we're very excited here to talk about human rights, sustainable futures, and anything that we think relates to internet policy making. So my name is Marianne Franklin. I'm co-chair of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. Thank you for coming to our meeting this morning. Uh, to my Right is Minda Moreira, who is the co-chair. She's going to be timekeeper and moderating and keeping us all on track. And each speaker will introduce as we go. We have government, we have activism, we have technical community. So let's see how it goes. We only have an hour. And um, please, this is a new agenda we are forming. So we are keeping this onto the record. That is our objective today, is to uh, collate and uh, see where the points of commonality are and where there might be divergences. So just think, the very first metal that is taken out of the ground in the Central Republic of the Congo to the very last piece of pra pra plastic that might be floating into the Pacific Ocean and finding itself on the beaches of beautiful atolls that are also going underwater because of global warming. So this is a huge set of connections and uh, human rights are at the heart of all of it. So thank you for coming. Um, we'll now turn to uh, our first speakers, uh, and I think we'll start with Deepti Batur from IT for Change, and she'll uh, say more about her affiliation. Everybody has three minutes, 
and uh, thank you very much. All right, um, thank you. Uh, I'm Deepthi. I'm a senior research associate with IT for Change. Uh, we're a, a research and advocacy organization based out of Bangalore, India. And um, our focus has always been at looking at the intersections of technology development and looking at paradigms which focus and come from the global south. Um, so in terms of my take on sustainability, um, I'm drawing from research that we are currently undertaking. It's a 12 to 14 country research that we're um, doing across the globe in like various places, global north and south, and we're looking at the rise of digital platforms. So it's a good uh, time to be speaking about this, um, you know, at the IGF. And uh, we just came out with our mid-project reflections where we were able to look at what the policy landscape is telling us about the rise of digital platforms, about the rise of the digital economy. Um, so. I'm happy to sort of pull from that to talk about our take on sustainability. Um, I think uh, Marianne's opening points were very sort of, um, they set the stage really well because I think there is a certain myth about the digital economy, this very pervasive discourse of asset lightness, the idea that, you know, nothing need be owned, but everything is controlled and everything is consolidated. And these many, many invisible layers that are underneath, and especially the highly extractive, the highly, um, disastrous consequences for the environment and the ecology that we fail to see that are never sort of visibilized is essentially I think a new form of um, you know the whole idea of capitalism has always had the idea of externalities the consequences of business practices which are brutal and often end up hurting the most marginalized and the most vulnerable of geographies communities and people with the digital economies, um, this is getting more and more obfuscated and hidden, especially when we consider this myth of asset lightness where nobody owns everything. And it's really pervasive because it actually borrows from some very, very positive discourses. The idea of collaborative consumption, the idea of the sharing economy, which actually kind of arose as a response to the 2008 financial crisis, to the idea of really looking at um, runaway excesses of capitalism and sort of finding a way back you know to more sustainable consumption to more sustainable patterns of consumer behavior to sort of like sharing what we have not consuming more than what's needed and the kernel of that which is highly admirable and valuable has today become what we know as the platform economy what we know as um, you know the whole rise of large technology giants and uh, this is the def default model for the digital paradigm. Um, so these, um, to me, I think sustainability is not just about environment and ecology, but it ultimately sits on many different layers of policy gaps that we've managed to observe through our research. The fact that um, there is so much work precarity, the fact that um, social protections, uh, especially in the global south, are so poor and so unable to respond to the rise of these kinds of movements. The fact that we have data frameworks that are um, completely caught up in a certain idea about free data flows without really understanding about um, the need that any, any future that's sustainable is ultimately any future that is local has to privilege local innovation, has to forward local innovation. And um, so that's basically where we are at. And I'll pass the next. Um. Thank you so much, Dave T, for keeping to time. Thank you. So we're going from uh, South Asia, and I think it's very suitable that we then move ever so slightly to the South Pacific. So I have great pleasure in introducing Maureen Hilliard from the Cook Island government. So Maureen, the floor is yours for three minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, environmental issues, of course, are always going to impact um, on small island states, and it's really important that um, you know that we make a, you know like a, con a real effort to um, ensure that the um, sustainability in respect to our island environments are sort of like maintained. Um, we, you know, within the Pacific, we've got um, islands that actually range from 1,500 population to 7 million. So th there's actually a wide range of, um, of connectivity sort of like issues that need to be dealt with. Um, in uh, relation to the small economies, you've got affordab affordability issues, 
where, um, where uh, countries with small um, populations are having to pay a lot more for their internet than some of the larger islands. Although, um, the, for example, Papua New Guinea, which has the 7 million um, population, also has issues relating to um, having um, infrastructure being put up and uh, vandalised by people who are not aware of what the internet is yet. Um, they don't have connectivity and there are, there are sort of like a lot of cultural issues that need to be dealt with. So this is, you know, this is really important. Don't forget to tell me when they're going to start. Um, with regards to um, our little island, a population of 14,000 people, you know, we have issues relating to tourism. Tourism is our ma the mainstay of our economy. And so what we've got is um, the impacts, not only sort of like on, um, with regards to natural, with climate change, but also with human impacts. So the, the p um, plastics issue was something uh, that was mentioned. But there's also the issue of um, governments sort of like wanting to expand on the tourism thing and are taking over valuable um, land, uh, like for wetlands, uh, for um, forest areas, that uh, you know we need to sort of like be be protecting for the future of our um, future generations. But you know um, this is this becomes an economic issue. Renewable energy is something that is sort of like quite um, important uh, in, re in regards to sort of like cutting down on fossil fuels. But at the same time, um, you know, like I know that in a few years' time we're going to have a whole lot of batteries that are going to be sitting around waiting to be. Um, sent somewhere because uh, we can't sustain them on our island. So again, uh, these are, there are issues that we need to be looking at now um, to actually look at the sustainable future. Thanks very much, Maureen. If I could just underscore a very important point with tourism, uh, you get uneven uh, levels of access and uneven levels of bandwidth and speed so that certain sectors of the uh, population or tourism get the level that we're all used to and the rest of the populace has to put up with no access or no bandwidth. And it's these inequalities that become structural if we do not take into account the implicit right to access and the implicit right to all the other human rights we have, which are now online. So as a means of continuity, I'd like to move, uh, I think the best um, next segue, Michael. Michael Oja, thank you very much, who in fact is our pioneer in getting this topic on to sort of government forum, a uh, govern internet governance uh, fora. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. That, that, that's very kind of you, Mary. I don't know if, I don't know if that's true, but um, I, I will just want to quickly just restate kind of why are we talking about this here? A lot of times when, when I was bringing up the fact that we need to talk more about sustainability, people would say, well, what does it have to do with the internet? Why are we talking about that at the IGF? Um, well, the fact is, first of all, uh, if anybody has read the, the IPCC report that just came out, we have about 12 to 13 years to fix our problem with the Earth, and that's uh, really a significant existential problem that we're dealing with now. Sorry to be that guy in the room that's saying, that's talking about it, but it's something we can't bury our heads in the sand in. Um, number two is that access to, int um, access to information, access to the internet is such a key, uh, is such a key human right, but at the same time, um, we cannot legitimately discuss ac um, access unless we talk about sustainability. As Marianne pointed out, there are so many elements uh, to the internet that uh, relates to the environment, to energy, to things like climate change, etc. sustainable consumption, production. In fact, there are so many um, links within the, for instance, the SDGs um, uh, between energy and infrastructure and uh, sustainable consumption and production, but there is not actually any explicit, um, uh, you know, kind of link within the language of the SDGs themselves that actually pulls together energy and infrastructure, etc. So essentially, it's 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 not mentioned. It's not d talked about hardly anywhere. And that, that, to me, is a key gap. It's a key problem. And so the fact that you know, we're, we want to situate sustainability within a human rights lens, I think that's not necessarily uh, just important. That's really something that we should have been doing years ago. Um, just to give you a little bit of information, um, uh, ICT electricity use, um, based on some estimates from about a year or two ago, um, place uh, ICTs at about 10% of global electricity use. So it's not just you know the energy powering our homes, it's also the fact that 
um, you know, uh, about two to three percent of global greenhouse gas emissions um, are are coming straight from uh, ICTs, and that's only growing. To give you a, a better, um, even more, um, uh, a, a better landscape of it, basically with the rise of machine-to-machine -machine, um, uh, communication, with the rise of Internet of Things, etc., um, the the amount of data we're producing each year is practically ex uh, exponential. So the fact is, this is you know think about how many people just alone, and me included, watch high-definition video. That it takes a, it, it takes more and more energy just just to power those basic. Um, you know, uh, things that, we're, that we who have been on the internet continue to use, but especially it's something to consider whenever we're talking about getting more people online. How are we doing that? Well, thankfully, when we, when we talk about the people that are not connected at the moment, uh, already, uh, you know, as it exists, about one billion people in the world still don't have access to reliable energy, much less to the internet you know, or, or to, to mobile connectivity. So, so these are all interrelated, and I'll just kind of wrap up by saying that the solution to it, the solution to all of this should, is, you know, is really, really critical. We, it's something that is, is, it involves multi-stakeholder collaboration. Um, we need supply chain overviews. We need to, you know, look at how we're, you know, how the recyclability of the materials that we're using, whether it be fiber, or um, you know even something as uh, something like you know things like e-waste, etc. These are all things that involve collaboration at every level, private sector, government, and civil society. And it's really important that we, as individuals, as members of civil society, hold um, both ourselves as well as the wider uh, community accountable, because it's our earth and we're ruining it. Thanks so much, Michael. I'm going to bring us to. Uh the last of the first round of speakers. I just want to remind everyone that if you have a point to make, a, a fact to give, a concrete suggestion to offer, we will open it up to the floor shortly and our speakers will then have another round. Just want to remind you that Article 1 of the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet stresses that um, everyone has the right to access to and make use of Internet technologies, I will add. That includes quality of service, that includes freedom of choice of system and software use. That, ensure, that includes ensuring digital inclusion and also the principles of net neutrality and net equality. So as our cities and our towns become more and more plugged in to this large network and as this large network, as Michael points out, becomes more and more needy of uh, energy and more and more generous with what it exert, what it, um, what it, uh, what's the word, um, produces as um, heat, we need to consider the issues of rights, sustainability, and cities. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Orul Ratterink from the city of Am Amsterdam. Uh, so he will talk a little bit about a brand new coalition that our coalition has been uh, very proud to be part of, this new Digital Cities Coalition. So the floor is yours, Rul. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Marianne. Uh, yeah, my name is Roel Ratrink. I'm international advisor for the city uh, of Amsterdam. Um, and as, as a city, we definitely see all the benefits that digitalization brings, but we also have to voice some concerns about the social and environmental impact and that you know, we must regulate digitalization as well. Um, because in the city, all these factors, environmental, social, digital, really come Together, uh, we are, of course, the closest democratic institution to citizens, to communities. So we also have to deal with the consequences uh, of digital rights violations, of uh, uh, pollution. And the data centers that were already mentioned and the data use is going through data centers, which are, for a large part, also located around cities. And, of course, we also have uh, certain obligations as cities to manage public space, to set standards, for companies, for data centers, for example, we can use our public procurement. You know, when we buy certain services and goods, we can set standards for companies. Uh, and of course, we have an obligation to protect vulnerable communities as well. So digital rights are very high on our city agenda as well. Data sovereignty is mentioned explicitly by our city government. Uh, inclusion, digital inclusion is mentioned specifically. Open source and open data standards. Uh, and digital rights are explicitly mentioned as a form of civil rights uh, by our uh, city government. 
uh, and I already mentioned the data centers, and we also try to invest in projects to research how we can, um, well, limit the impact of data centers. So we pump, well, we are researching possibilities to pump uh, water to the data centers to use this water for cooling and to use the heated water uh, to feed it back into the, well, we call it the heat net, so to say, so to warm houses or industry, etc. Uh, we invested in research, setting up international standards for uh, procurement for data centers as well, and um, well, value-added plans, which are a way to recalculate the energy use. And the latest uh, move is that in a few days in Barcelona, at the Smart City Conference, we will launch the Cities Coalition for uh, Digital Rights, which is really based on the uh, coalition for. Uh, the Charter for Human Rights and Principles uh, on, for the Internet. Uh, it's Barcelona, New York, and Amsterdam, and we're trying to kickstart this, this movement, and we're trying to make it a worldwide movement uh, under the umbrella of the UN. Um, you know, we would like to have at least uh, 100 cities join us in, in the first year. Um, the goal is to learn from each other, of course, and, and to develop actions like the ones I mentioned, but also to, to, uh, uh, to set a standard and to make a statement. So the launch will be uh, uh, on uh, Wednesday, and yeah, I think that's the most important thing to pass on a message that you know digitalization is great, the internet is great, it brings many benefits, but we must also be aware of issues like human rights in this context. Thank you very much, and just to underscore the uh, important move forward in this this collaboration is that more people on this planet now live in cities than do not live in cities. So. Uh, these three cities are going to put their best foot forward uh, in terms of uh, these connections. Now, I'd like to open it up to the floor. Uh, please, this is an open mic session in many ways, and we're trying to get as many issues onto this first agenda as possible so that in the next outing we can focus. So please, if you take the mic, please say your name and your affiliation. So uh, the floor is up. The floor is all yours. Who would like to uh, make a contribution or comment on any of the comments made so far? Don't be shy. I know it's one of the very first sessions. We're not warmed up yet, but you know, uh, we won't bite. Thank you, Joanna. <laughs> Joanna Kulesha, I work at the university of lots and I wear a few other hats, but I'll stick to the university affiliation. I always appreciate Michael's, I always appreciate it, sorry. Should I introduce myself again? All right, so it's Joanna Kulesha. I work at the university in Lodz, which is in Poland. Um, I always appreciate Michael's environmental take on human rights and I wanted to dig on that a little bit more. Um, I remember us meeting at various venues and you mentioned that there are various aspects to the environment and human rights. I was wondering if you might be willing to explore that context because if you just mentioned one of those aspects, I'd be happy to hear more about the environmental aspects of human rights, particularly when it comes to the environmental protection, air, etc., etc. I'm, ha I'm happy to specify that question further, but I think you know what I'm linking on. I would be happy to, for you to elaborate on other issues that are related to environment and human rights. Thank you. Before Michael elaborates, we'll just gather one or two more questions or comments. Thank you very much, Joanna. Yeah, good morning. Uh, I'm Yvonne Sleiman uh, from a Ministry of Telecommunications in Lebanon. Uh, just I have a question. Uh, why uh, we don't put a, a constitution for uh, human rights uh, in internet? And... Uh, uh, in this con uh, constitution, we, we mention uh, uh, an additional of the rights, okay, uh, the, the, the limitation and the protection of the human uh, from the internet risks. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll consider that very challenging uh, question in a minute. Um, refer you to the, to the constitution in so many words that we already have. But one more question or comment before Michael responds to Joanna's query. Anybody else? Okay, Michael, would you like to respond? Or anybody else can also respond as well. Which specific rights are being evoked as we speak of uh, sustainability in the environment? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind, and although this isn't necessarily one that's 
you know, that's been framed this way, but it's more about the right to a future. I mean, I'm, I, I just turned 30 this year, and something that my partner and I talk about, we talk a lot about whether or not we should have a kid or kids, you know, and I, I think that I know so many people my age uh, or around my age that are currently having this, this discussion. Like, is it environmentally sound to have a child now? And th that to me is something that I don't think any other generation that has ever existed has ever had to consider. Of course, there were safety considerations, uh, you know, for the for the longest time. I think to myself, what was it like to, you know, be to be a woman that was pregnant in 1939 in Western Europe? I mean, that's probably not exactly the easiest time either. But the fact is, it's like, you know, do we have a, a human right? to our own future, to our own civilization. That's something that I think about way more than I ever wanted to. And that's something that I deal with quite often. Um, of course, there are the, the human rights of, um, do we have the right to live well, to, to well-being, to exist in, uh, in cities that aren't um, crowded, but, you know, that aren't suffocated by dirty air, to, to drink water that is um, you know, not uh, contaminated with pollutants, with plastic, with uh, industrial waste, uh, et cetera, with human waste. Um, these are, I mean, these all fit into the wider concept of sustainable development, and whether it's to the growth of humanity or of civilization, or whether it's to uh, ensuring its well-being, I th this is why it's important to talk about this within the context of the internet and within this community, because everybody has to do their part. The internet, the, the, you know, the actors and the stakeholders involved with the internet governance and with internet proliferation, we need to do our part. Um, obviously, aviation needs to do its part, private sector needs to do its part, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know, and what I would say is we have to look at it holistically because Although, you know, uh, to, to be frank, if, if anybody's familiar with the, um, with the Carbon Futures report, it's essentially say, uh, it was a report that came out a few years ago saying that, you know, the majority of all greenhouse gas emissions are coming from about 100 companies. Most of those companies have to do with either energy production, clearly, um, agriculture, or with construction, specifically something like cement, which uh, cement mixing, which which uh, you know emits a lot of greenhouse gases. Gases. I just want to make this point because I'm sorry, everyone. I get really uh, you know passionate about this, and and I don't mean to lecture because I'm assuming that if anybody's in this room, you know you, you know of the the problem at hand. However, I, I do have to always kind of remind myself to stay. Um, you know, focused on the on the positives, on the on the organizations and the initiatives that are working to do this within our own community. Uh, there's community networking. I don't know if anybody, how many people here are familiar with community networks. Community networks. I say over and over again, energy access is something that community networks deal with from the very beginning. Whenever an you know organize or whenever these people are going into rural and remote communities and they say, okay, how do we connect them? Well, the first thing that they need to do usually is set up solar panels because a lot of those individuals don't even necessarily have access to grid power. By rem reminding ourselves to, to stay within this holistic framework w with underpinned with the idea that we need to respect human rights. Respecting the environment and respecting human rights go hand in hand because we need the environment a lot more than the environment needs us. Thanks, Michael. Would anybody else from the uh, panel like to uh, also respond to which specific rights are being uh, evoked? Maureen? Well, I'd just like to um, agree. I mean, I, I think uh, Michael sort of like expressed a lot of the, um, the issues that, that, you know, the rights um, that people have need, you know, are, um, you know, we should be um, providing um, our, our um, populations with. For, I'm just looking at it from the pers um, perspective of the Pacific, for example. We've got a, um, in, on our island, we have a population of 14,000. I mean, that's sort of like less than some of your little um, suburbs. But if you took out all the, all, the, all the electricity, if you took out and said that, okay, these guys aren't going to have um, um, internet anymore, uh, they're not going to ha have an access to the internet. I mean, the uproar. But this is what happens in, um, you know, that's, this is what is happening in the Pacific, um, is that there, you know, people, um, 
there are a lot of islands that, for example, have got fibre cable, and, and there are still people on those islands that do not have access. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, like there are, I, I mentioned um, the uh, government, um, um, uh, the government sort of like priorities. Sometimes the internet is not a priority. Um, it's, it, apart from the fact that they use it for everything, that is not an area of investment for a lot of our, um, of our, our governments because they've got other interests. Um, and so the, you know, like when it comes to, like for example, one island, Nui, 1,500 people at, the partic at that particular point in time, climate change, a, a cyclone hit it, it lost everything. Everything on that island sort of like went. It took a long time to deliver um, services back to normal. When it comes to human rights, it's, uh, for example, this is when, like donors, uh, countries who actually support um, and m want to make sure that um, the um, populations actually get back to normality. Um, and and th there we're starting from basic human rights. Thank you, Maureen. And as Article 4 of the Charter says, there is a right to development through the internet, which of course is the spirit of the Sustainable Development Goals, and that includes poverty reduction and human development, but also, as we've noted in Article 4b, environmental sustainability, that the internet, however defined internet technologies, smart cities, mobile phone masts, must be used in a sustainable way. And this relates to the disposal also of e-waste and to the use of internet technologies for the protection of the environment. So um, would anyone like to continue, Deputy or Rule, on this theme? Yeah, I think um, I'll just to, to, uh, sort of briefly build on what Michael said, which I find really interesting, the right to the future. And I think what you said about the right to development, I want to come back to... Um, the idea of um, sustainability is not just about, um, you know, reining in the destruction that we are seeing um, on various accounts. It's about, like, I think a more a holistic framework that not, it's about like, the fact that if we are wanting to innovate locally, we want to build small systems, we want to build um, network or economies and sort of um, outfits that are able to um, be locally situated, be able to accrue most of the value to the local value chain, to the population, etc. It's not just about sort of reining in the larger excesses that we see, it's also about creating enabling policy environments that will allow um, startups to sort of do well, that will allow cooperatives to do well, that will allow the principles of the solidarity economy, the social economy to really come forward. It's about the fact that 80% of start, it's since the 1970s, um, this is a fact that the McKinsey Institute has found that startups more and more die. They don't really, they don't really thrive, they don't really come forward, they just get bought out or they get sold out. I mean, or they get eaten out of competition. That's the, I think, the more um, uh, prevalent trend that we see. So we need to make space for, I mean, an internet rights approach needs to make space for a right to development that is about like many, many different things. It's about like uh, strengthening a lot of these things, strengthening local worker protection so that precarity is not so um, awful and like so completely out of control. So it's about like a lot of different things, I would think. Thanks, Deputy. Rule, did you have any comments? No, I don't have any okay, comments. okay. I just want to um, extend the apologies of Megan McDermott from the Mozilla Foundation uh, due to extenuating circumstances. She's unfortunately unable to make the session. Uh, is there anybody here from the technical or uh, government sector, um, technical community? Because with the development of smart cities, uh, there's a lot of uh, business to be had, um, a lot of products to be bought and sold, a lot of techie-based futures. Uh, does anybody would like to comment on some of these issues from our very, uh, give us some concrete, uh, specific examples? from the floor, that's my challenge. Uh, mainly because the internet isn't just wishy-washy software and ideas, it's hard, it's tubes and wires and satellites and plastics and concrete. It's a very solid material thing, these networks. So we're not just talking about an ephemeral idea about all being you know, one world together. Someone had their hand up, thank you, please. Speak directly into the mic, name and affiliation and thank you very much. I am uh, Kushagr Bhargav from India. I'm representing youth at IGF. Um, so I've been uh, in the technical community uh, for the past uh, three years. 
I've, I've, uh, currently I'm uh, in, a, in the private sector, but I've been, uh, I've uh, been involved in academia and have been working uh, with the Indian government as well uh, in several projects. So my experience with the, uh, in the technical uh, domain of the internet has been uh, specifically in the domain of online social networks. We had been collecting uh, data, uh, publicly available data, open source data from uh, different social networks. I've been analyzing different kinds of activities that people have been doing, uh, different kind of uh, content that people have been sharing. And uh, as, as we all know, different uh, big events have been affected by what people have been talking about, uh, right from uh, US presidential elections to Indian prime ministerial elections to Brexit. So this, this whole uh, concept of fake content or, or uh, this uh, spread of different kinds of opinions on the internet have been affecting us. Uh, specifically, I would like to talk about one of the works that we did uh, on Twitter. Uh, there was this uh, work, uh, so everyone would uh, know the concept of how Twitter works. There's this follower uh, and followee uh, terminology that is, uh, that is there on Twitter. We were uh, analyzing how people leverage this follower count to spread uh, different kinds of uh, fake or genuine information. There was this, uh, there's this whole market of uh, this black market which help people manipulate their follower count to increase their social influence. Uh, so uh, what people do is I create an account and I uh, change my picture to one of the most popular celebrities of India. Uh, I change my name to one of the most popular celebrities. For example, uh, if somebody knows uh, um, a movie celebrity, like uh, uh, in India, there's this very famous movie celebrity, Amitabh Bachchan. We were, we were uh, trying to uh, analyze his account. And somebody else created this uh, fake account with his name, with his picture, and got around 200,000 followers in, f uh, in a week. And then that person changed his name again change this uh, pr pr picture again and try to send, uh, spread the different kinds of content. And because 200,000 people are following that person, everyone gets to see that content. And it's very difficult for people to verify that content uh, very quickly unless there's, there's this uh, whole news of getting, uh, that content being getting viral and then people or media getting, uh, uh, checking that facts on ground. It's very difficult to check the facts very quickly. So that news, uh, whatever that account was talking, this, that news used to get spread to 200,000 followers in just a second. So these are, this is just one of the examples that we were studying. We, had, we, we tried to counter this uh, by uh, using some, uh, 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 so we used some, uh, if, if uh, more people are from technical background, we tried to uh, detect this behavior using some uh, uh, local neighborhood detection method uh, to analyze what are the anomalies in the diff, uh, in the network uh, and the, so uh, usually the nodes will will uh, form a cluster but if there's some anomaly some nodes will will not be forming uh, or will not be uh, a part of the cluster so these are the uh, the people who have just created the account or just uh, uh, had had got some uh, tremendous amount of increase in the followers in, in very uh, odd amount of time so okay. these Thank are some you. of the things that we explored Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. That's uh, looking at sustainability in the online settings in terms of uh, on a qualitative level. Thank you very much. Are there any, um, thank you, from the floor. Uh, my name is Atif Fatik. I'm from Pakistan. I work for the Ministry of IT in Pakistan. Uh, before that, I was uh, associated with the academia. I have a background in electrical engineering. Um, we, when I was in my, you know, working with the uh, research cell that we had in my university, uh, we were working on a small component of smart cities, which was uh, the smart grid systems in uh, in Pakistan. And this is, is a problem that we have had, you know, load shedding and having not enough electricity to go around and uh, uninterrupted power supply is not a given in Pakistan. Uh, for that, there was something that uh, we worked on and that was a load forecasting model. Uh, it was based on AI. Uh, basically, it was based on machine learning, artificial neural networks that helped us uh, predict uh, the exact amount of electricity that was required for the next year and, and the prediction model that we had, uh, that is effective up to around 98-99%. Now that model, since this was like way back in like 2014 when I had not, uh, you know, sold my soul to the devil and joined the bureaucracy. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, but but since then I have had the opportunity to work with my colleagues back at uh, where we were working the research cell it was called CSNR. Um, we have now been using that prediction model to help detect electricity theft in Pakistan. We are using the same model to help uh, uh, find U UGF, yeah, UFG. That's uh, uh, you know there are sp uh, spots of gas, of natural gas that you you know that gets lost in the whole supply. There's a whole technical story behind that. But essentially, uh, we have been uh, harnessing and trying to you know um, use ind indigenous, uh, indigenously developed small projects through funding that the ministry is you know giving to um, projects we have an organization that is helping students come up with ideas we try to give them a direction okay this is like the major theme that we're working on we want you to come up with something and the results have been wonderful so harnessing the talent that we have in the university that's been that's been amazing for our government Thank you very much. I think um, in terms of recycling, harnessing small use of water, green forms of energy, I'm sure, Rul, um, you would have something you'd like to say to that. If well, we think about a concrete example. Yeah, actually, I, I would like to re respond to, to a few things you mentioned. So you mentioned the use of uh, AI and algorithm analysis. And so one of the projects we did in our city is we, uh, so we have uh, a system in our city where any citizen can uh, uh, file a complaint or um, what you call it, when there's anything in the public area that you know might not be right, like a traffic light might not be working, whatever, um, they 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 send a message to the to the city government, and before you had to you know select a certain issue from a drop drop down list, etc. And this often it, this didn't end up with the right person. This information, and now we're using AI to analyze the complaint. So you just write your complaint and AI analyzes it and sends it to the right person. So it's really a really small thing, but I totally agree that AI can definitely be of huge public use. But this is just, we are really making the first steps, right? This is such a simple thing. So there's this huge unlocked potential. And, uh, but I also do think that companies have a huge role to play in that because uh, at this point, you know, we have open source, open data projects. So, for example, we get, as a city, we gather some data on air pollution and traffic. And we publish this data online. And it's very good because people can use it to, to monitor us as a city and, you know, to ask critical questions. But it's not really of huge social importance at this point. While on the other hand, the things that were mentioned by the sir before, um, you know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, they have this huge, huge data set which can be used, you know, to, to anal like, like you did, to analyze psychological, social, sociological phenomena. So we could even counter, you know, the spread of fake news, hate speech, even terrorism, online spreading of terrorism. We could use that data, but we need, you know, we cannot, the data we gather as public sector is, nothing compared to the data that's being gathered by uh, private companies. I just wanted to also, um, just to bring an example, just before I um, arrived here, one of the things that I'm doing um, in the Cook Islands at the moment is to write a, an ICT strategy. Uh, they didn't have one. Um, and one of the um, one of the important things is that um, I went to the ISP to find out so like what the status was, in especially in regards to mobile technology, um, <clears throat> and found that the Cook Islands is um, probably in within the Pacific is one of the top um, uh, social media users. In fact, it's in, and it's uh, it was in the top ten within the Asia Pacific region. Um, and of a, of a um, population of 15,000 across the whole of the Cook Islands, um, we had 15,000 social media, uh, 15,000 mobile um, um, plans. Um, and that was uh, 3,000 of them were sort of like prepaid and, uh, no, sorry, postpaid, and the 12,000 were prepaid. So. It means that, for example, the focus of the ICT strategy is going to be very much focused on mobile use. But the fact that we actually had 100% penetration of, um, you know, of the you know, of our population with, um, you know, well, I mean, obviously some of the, the kids who are connected into that into that um, population um, uh, demographic don't count, but maybe they do have them. 
Um, but we just need to, um, to make sure that when we do the strategy, it focuses on getting, um, using that, uh, that, that connectivity that's already there, despite the fact that it's fairly expensive. Um, so you know, what, what, what's important to them? Trying to change their behaviours from perhaps social media to other interests. Thanks very much. Mo uh, mobile, social media, mobile phones, the future. Michael. Thank you. I, I have just a, a couple more things to, to add, and, and so actually some responses as well. So the first, first of all, um, you, you know, it was mentioned about the private sector and about collaboration there and about engagement. Absolutely. I mean, already Facebook, Google, Apple, they're investing in renewable energy for their, um, for their data centers. That, that's, that's an important, but still only one piece of the pie. There's still very much uh, many other considerations to take into effect. Number two is coming back to this idea of about uh, you know human rights and how it relates to everything, um, the right to the future. Um, you know something that I, I remembered uh, just a couple minutes ago is that uh, we talk you know we think about climate change and rising sea levels. Well, first of all, we don't. I mean, the fact that we have a representative from the Cook Islands here is it's really something because you know rising sea levels and climate change are something that uh, forgive me if I'm wrong but it's something that you think about every day, and there are already climate refugees from, uh, for specifically from uh, you know, the, uh, the South Pacific. So, um, but to talk about how it's related, um, a study came out earlier this year that just looking at the United States alone, um, in the, within the next 15 years, 1,101 internet nodes, whether it's data centers or content delivery networks, et cetera, are at risk of being underwater within the next 15 years. So to talking about this, how it relates to the internet, uh, it's our infrastructure, is our bread and butter that we're using to connect people currently. It's absolutely relevant, um, okay. again. And, um, you know, and really this, this it comes back to the larger issue of solidarity. I mean, it, it, how can we talk about human rights and only think about it within a silo? The fact is human rights are holistic. It's something that we think about from, you know, uh, from start to finish. So I think really emphasizing that aspect of solidarity. And then lastly, um, something that I was publishing about last year was, was something I, I called sustainable access. So it's not just about the sustainable from the environmental side of things, but it's also, it's kind of like, okay, how do we get people on the internet? How do we enable internet connectivity? But how do we keep people on the internet? And how do we enable an environment that is, uh, you know, one that is, is, makes people want to stay online? Just yesterday, I, I saw a, a Kashmiri activist that's a friend of mine saying that she's giving up Twitter because of the harassment that she faces. Um, you know, people who are not connected, people who are underconnected, digital media literacy skills are absolutely, re uh, you know, necessary to, to ensure that they can participate online. Just imagine if you connected to the internet today for the first time. Just, just, you know, all the dangers that exist, all the kinds of, uh, you know, uh, information that exists, that's misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, etc. The fact is, you know, these are, these are all connected. And I can't stress that enough. And, uh, and so, you know, I just wanted to, I was trying to tie all these things in together. It's, it's not a, a one-off solution. Thanks very much, Michael, and I think your point's very well taken. We're running out of time. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask the panel, and I think the question is, how can we shift the environmental, and here I mean the natural and built environment, environmental burden, as well as the other more uh, social environment? How can we, sh if we admit, if we accept that there is a burden that just the building out, the developing, and the extension of all forms of internet connectivity and use have an environmental burden, if that's the consensus, then in so many words, um, how can we, what are concrete suggestions to take away from this meeting to m shift that environmental burden of internet as a development goal, which it is now, so that it can enhance uh, the natural world we're living in and that it can be an enabler of full inclusion uh, to anything that ha needs a computer of one sort or another. So how can we shift that burden? What concrete suggestion does the panel have? It can be a small suggestion, something very concrete, and, um, and then we'll uh, just have a couple of words before you leave the room. So I'd like to start with a rule. 
uh, how do we shift that environmental burden to environmental um, positive? Yeah, well, we, we talked about this before, Marianne, and I think you, you said it right, that uh, new digital developments, whether they're coming from the private sector, from the public sector, whatever, they need to be socially inclusive or environmentally aware by design. So not, you know, have this huge digital explosion and then try to regulate it afterwards. But right now we're in this process and, you know, we can do it now. So I think um, that that will be it. Oh, sustainable environmental human rights by design. Okay, thank you, Rule. Fantastic. Um, Deep to you, for you. I think, I mean, I'll start with a small suggestion because I was listening to some of the points about smart cities, etc. I think the key really is, um, I think if we get our global data policy frameworks right, I think that's a great building block um, to sort of like thinking about how the future of the internet can be reshaped because I think it's very much all about the data. It's about like how we... Um, you know, build context-appropriate data frameworks for specific states, for specific de development goals, etc. that are bottom-led, that are local-led and locally sort of situated, so. Thank you. And Michael, in one sentence, what's your concrete suggestion to shift the burden? One sentence only. Just ha -ha. one sentence? Okay. Um, I would say, you know, integrate sustainability into the design of our networks, into the design of our, uh, our product chains as that relates to, to, um, to technology. And keep talking about this. Thank you, Michael, fantastic. And Maureen. Thank you, I agree with everyone. Um, I, but I think that we're very lucky where we are because we're starting from scratch. We can actually make sure, you know, hopefully from now, that we actually take in, into account, you know, um, environment, you know, human rights, all those things that actually make it a very successful, sustainable future. So I hope that's enough takeaways for now. I'd like to, just before I finish the session, the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition has a booth this year, and we're very excited, um, complete with balloons and our very own uh, youth representative of the age of three. So uh, if you go into the middle concourse and go left, and look right where there is, so please come and join us and chat. The other thing is, uh, please join our, our mailing list. We have our annual elections. We're looking for committed people who know the charter work, who want to join the steering committee and stand for uh, the steering committee. So all that is happening. We have many, many other sessions. Uh, we have one on refugees' rights, uh, which is continuing what we've been doing on Wednesday morning. We're participating in the Dynamic Coalition's main session. What else are we doing, Minda? Human Rights, Gender and Youth uh, main session uh, tomorrow at uh, 4.30 as well. Yes, so the brochures and everything's there. I'd like to thank the fantastic panel and thank you for being here and have a great Internet Governance Forum. And think, f think twice before you start um, a search because that uses up like dozens of kettles of boiling water. So maybe try and temper your own um, access while you're here. I know that's crazy but you might want to think about lo-fi forms of communication. Thank you.